Now, real quick, the whole idea behind this image was to create something that played along with the message that I have here on YouTube and my website, which is to help you elevate your photography and editing skills in GIMP. And I needed to create some special effects in GIMP to create the illusion that the camera was moving and beginning to elevate in a specific direction. So I'm gonna go over each one of those steps that I took to create this final design. So you know how to create this for yourself in the future if you need to create these types of effects. So the first thing I had to do was make a selection of the camera and myself and separate us from the background. And I used the foreground select tool to do that. I'm not gonna go over how to use that tool right now since I have another tutorial all about the foreground select tool. And you can find a link for that up here in the corner. So once I finished the selection process with the foreground select tool, I then applied a layer mask to remove the background and I ended up with this. The only problem is the foreground select tool or any selection tool in GIMP is not 100% perfect. And sometimes you're going to have to make some tweaks to the layer mask in order to get the results you want. Now, overall, GIMP did a pretty good job of making a selection for me. The one thing I did have to do to tweak it a little bit was I had to go around the shirt here because there was a white outline around it. So I did that already. The other thing I wanted to do before I placed it in the new document that I had was to give myself a haircut since we're in lockdown here in Ontario for the last couple months. And I haven't had a haircut in about seven, eight, maybe nine months. And I can give myself a haircut by painting with black with my paintbrush tool on the layer mask. I need to make sure the layer mask is selected and then just begin painting with black in the area that you want to remove. And just like that, I can give myself a haircut. Pretty cool, if you ask me. Now, if you need to add something back, you can paint with white. So I'm gonna switch the foreground color to white, and then I can add it back if I need to. So after I separated myself and the camera from the background, I then created a new document at 1920 by 1080 because I knew the intended output for this particular project was to be used online. So my website, social media sites, and YouTube. Based on that, that was the aspect ratio I chose for this project. So once I created that new document, I had to take this image and the camera and place it in that new document. So to do that, all I had to do was click on this layer and drag it over the tab and release to add it as a new layer in that document. Then I just used my move tool to move it into position. Now for the camera itself, it was a little bit larger than the document itself and was larger than I wanted. I didn't want something that large. So the first thing I had to do was rotate it, which I can do with shift plus R, and then I can click on the outside of the camera and rotate it into position. And then I had to make that camera smaller because it was still too large. It was just rotated, that's it. So I went to layer, scale layer, and then I typed in a width of, I think 500, maybe that was too small, that looks about right. And then I just moved it into position with my move tool again. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. Now, once I was done with that, the fun began because I had to begin shaping the light to create the mood I wanted because I wasn't able to do that with the lighting equipment that I had and I have to fix that now in GIMP. So if we take a look at my group layer here of myself, Parker, we can see the original image and then we have a hair dodge and burn layer. So I duplicated this layer by clicking here, right clicking on it and then applying the layer mask so I could remove that layer mask because I didn't need it any longer or at least for that particular edit. So if we take a look at the original, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off these two layers here. If we take a look at my hair here, it's really bright. So with the dodge and burn tool, I was able to make it darker. The burn tool in particular, because the burn tool will allow you to darken parts of your image and the dodge tool will allow you to make parts of the image brighter. So I wanted to make the hair darker because I found it too bright and my eyes were beginning to navigate to that part of the image because it was so bright. So by darkening up parts of your image, you can 
direct the direction you want your viewers to go, which in this case is the camera. So by shaping the light with dodging and burning and layer masks, I'm able to control the first thing that my viewers will see. So the next step was adjusting the exposure of the image and then using a layer mask to shape that light even more. So here is the exposure adjustment layer here. And if we go up to colors and click on exposure, you can adjust the exposure brighter or darker with this slider right here. And I believe I dropped it to minus two, which is the equivalent of two stops. If you're not familiar with stops in photography, make sure to check out that video right there in the upper corner. So once I applied the exposure adjustment, I then added a white layer mask. And then I was able to paint with black to remove that lighting from that layer because the layer below it has the original exposure. It's showing it much brighter now. So if I paint with white, it's going to make it darker. So by utilizing the layer mask and painting with black and white, I was able to shape the light to be brighter or darker where I wanted it. Now, the key to this is to use a low opacity and to use a lower force amount. That way you can slowly and gradually build up the lighting effect you want and feather it so it looks more natural. So once I was done with doing the dodging and burning and the lighting adjustments for myself and the camera, I then began organizing the layers because I knew based on this project, I was going to require a lot of layers in order to achieve this design and without grouping them, it would have been really chaotic in the layers panel. And it would have been hard to find the layers I needed if they weren't grouped together by category. So that's why I have a Parker group here and a Nikon Originals group. So I can access those later on if I need to make further adjustments to the lighting, the dodging and burning, or if I need to go back to the original layer mask and make adjustments to that. So if you click right here, you can create a new layer group and then you click and drag a layer over top of it. And then once it's indented like this, you know it's inside of that layer group. And again, it's really helpful to have everything organized this way versus not having them organized. So the next step was to begin creating the motion blur to give the illusion that the camera was actually moving in a specific direction or elevating. And to do that, all I had to do was start with the original Nikon original layer here and duplicate it. I wanted to remove the background. So to do that, I have to right click and select apply layer mask. And then I need to put it in its own grouped layer. So if I click and drag this out, I can then create a new grouped layer, which I did. And you can see right here, motion blur. Let me show you how I applied that motion blur. If I go up to filters, blur and select linear motion blur, I can then create that motion blur and adjust the angle or the direction that the camera is going in because of the angle, it's going to give the impression that it's going in a certain direction. So the first thing I wanted to do was create that angle. And what I wanted was the camera to start in my bottom right hand up to the top left hand. So I have to mimic that position or that angle. And I can do that by grabbing the angle dial right here and changing the arrow to point in the direction I want it to go, which is right around there. And then all I have to do is increase the length to my liking and click OK to get that motion blur. The only problem is it's really hard to tell that that's a camera at first glance. So what I need to do is go up to opacity and tone that down by dropping the opacity down to around 40 to 50 or depending on your own personal preference. And because I have the original camera layer here below it and it's sharp, it's coming through and we can now see that that is indeed a camera. But because we still have some of that remnants of the motion blur, we can tell that the camera is beginning to move in a certain direction. Now, the other thing I needed to do to enhance the illusion was blur it just a little bit, but not with motion blur, but with Gaussian blur. So I took this original layer here again, duplicated it, created a new grouped layer called Nikon Gaussian blur, which you can see right here. 
and then I went up to filters, blur, Gaussian blur, and then I increased the size of the blur to right around five. And you can see that I did put that in the name so I knew the amount of blur I applied in case I needed to go back and make adjustments to that later on. Now, the other thing was it was too intense at 100% opacity. So I dropped the opacity down to 30 to help the camera show through a little bit and be a little bit sharper versus completely blurred out. And I believe that helps enhance the overall effect. Now, the next thing I wanted to do was continue with the illusion that the camera was actually moving. And I wanted to give it a starting point, which was my bottom right hand. And I created a large glow around that position. And then I took that layer, duplicated it, I squeezed it and I stretched it to give the illusion that it was going to go from point A to point B. And even though I had motion blur on the camera already, I wanted to enhance the visual of that actually happening by applying these glow effects. So to do that, I grabbed my original Nikon camera layer here and I duplicated the grouped layer and I right clicked on it and I selected merge layer group so I could start off with a new camera layer. And then I used my move tool to move it into position, which is on my hand right here. And then I went up to filters, blur, Gaussian blur, and I selected an amount of right around 80 to 90. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the original one that I did, which is right here. And now we can see that glow right here, but we need to colorize it. But before we do that, I wanna go ahead and take this layer because I wanna duplicate it to make it more intense or brighter. Now I'm going to right click and select merge down to merge those two layers together. Now to colorize it, to add a yellow or orange color, I'm gonna go up to colors and select colorize and I'm going to choose my color from here to give it a more of a orange type of color. All right, so what I need to do next is I need to begin shaping that glow so it's more in line with the width of the camera. That's just a personal preference. The other thing is I want that glow behind my hand. I don't necessarily want it to be glowing on top or behind my hand down here or on my thumb. So sometimes you can just move your layers into a new position to achieve the same results as applying a layer mask and painting with black. Even though I need one for this effect, I sometimes move my layers to get the same results. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to apply a white layer mask and I'm going to grab my paintbrush tool and I'm just going to shape this a little bit on the outside here and over here as well. So the next thing I did was I duplicated this layer and I applied the layer mask and now I want to stretch that glow to go from point A to point B. The first thing I need to do is I need to increase my layer boundary size. Otherwise, it's going to be contained within it. So I'm going to go back up to layer and select layer to image. And then I'm going to grab my unified transform tool to make that transition from the shape it is now to more elongated. So if I grab that from my toolbar here, we can see that it is right here, shift plus T. If I click on that layer, I can then manipulate the size by grabbing the diamonds inside of the squares here to reposition and to change the shape of it. So now it's getting longer and skinnier. I'll go ahead and move it up into position. Once I click enter or return, it will apply that new shape based on the adjustments I made to the uniform transform tool. How cool is that? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and delete these and this is what I ended up with right here. Now for these, I also adjusted the opacity of the second layer that I created here by duplicating the first shape because it wasn't bright enough for me originally. And then I dropped the opacity down to 50%. So you'll need to make adjustments based on your own creative vision. Once I completed the glowing effect, the next challenge was to match the color of that glow to the rest of the image because other parts of the image should be 
reflecting or absorbing the color of that glow. So if we take a look at my shirt here, and if I turn off my color grading grouped layer here, we can see the original color of the light when I took the image originally. And when I turn it on, we can now see that the color of the glow is being reflected off of the shirt. Now, in order to create that, all I had to do was create a new layer and fill it in with that color. And then I applied a black layer mask to remove that color completely. And then with my paintbrush tool and white set to the foreground, I was able to paint on that color onto the shirt. Again, the key for this is making sure that your brush tool is set to a lower opacity and that the force amount is set to a lower amount as well. So you can gradually build up and feather that effect into the areas where you want. And then once I completed that, the final step was to add this vintage photo texture overlay. Since my brand has a retro style, I wanted to add a little bit of vintageness to it. So what I did was once I brought the image layer in, I dropped the opacity here from 100 down to 10. So it would blend in a little bit, but I also had to change the blending mode from normal to screen to also help it blend in. So if you're interested in continuing elevating your photographic and editing skills in GIMP, check out that playlist right there to the left. Thanks for listening and have an awesome day.